Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. I'm history professor Jared Frederick. Thank you for joining us as we tune in tonight to episode seven of HBO's acclaimed miniseries, Band of Brothers. Where we left off Easy Company last time is that they had just participated in this very dogged defense of the crossroads community of Bastogne, Belgium, during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, this next episode will carry on that same sort of trend, the sequel of fighting and combat, as Easy Company pushes beyond Bastogne and sets its sights on the communities of Foy and Noville. There will be some very hard and emotionally gunt-wrenching episodes ahead for the men of Easy Company, and that appropriately earns this episode the title of The Breaking Point. How and why are the men of Easy Company being brought to the breaking point? Let's find out right now as we delve into episode seven of Band of Brothers. As Hubler's ambition throughout much of this series would indicate to us, uh, Lugers, Walthers, German pistols of any size or caliber were hot item commodities uh, among uh, the ever scavenging GIs of the Allied advance in Europe. Uh, but all that said, uh, carrying a, a Luger or a, a similar German weapon that had been captured uh, also posed some inherent risk uh, because if the Germans caught you yourself after you had seized one of these German sidearms, uh, it was in the realm of possibility that they would use it to end your own life as well. Not that there weren't already enough risks here uh, in, in Western Europe, uh, but certainly this was among them. Where's Dyke? He's, uh, he's around. Could you be a little more specific there, Sergeant? Not really, sir. As I mentioned in our last episode, uh, this character of Norman Dyke was uh, previously in division headquarters, and it was thought that he needed a little bit of frontline experience. Um, and so he helped to uh, fill the void in Easy Company after the accidental shooting of Fred Moose Heiliger in late October of 1944. And, you know, despite his uh, tall, uh, kind of athletic prowess, tall guy, blonde hair, square jaw. He did not instill a lot of confidence in his abilities among the men of Easy Company, and over time he would eventually earn the nickname of Foxhole Norman. The two will be shot! Sniper! No, no, he, he shot himself! Stop. Medic! What happened? Doc! The, the incident of Hubor accidentally shooting himself just piles on to this long wave of misery uh, that constantly engulfs these men. Uh, it was bad enough when the Germans killed one of your buddies, but when one of your pals accidentally shoots himself, uh, it, it really gnaws psychologically uh, at the men who knew him best. And it's it just uh, an incident of the utmost tragedy. By the time we got him to the aid station, he was already dead. Yeah, bullet cut the main artery in his leg, sir. These sorts of incidents certainly impacted Dick Winters as well, although he rarely showed it to his men. Uh, but in one letter that he wrote home uh, in the, the weeks immediately after this, um, these are words that he wrote on January 22nd, 1945, uh, this letter and many more are featured in my book, Hang Tough, the World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. And uh, he writes to his pen pal, Dieta Allman, this. Since I am in the Army, I daydream of fights, fighting Jerry's, outmaneuvering, outthinking, outshooting, and outfighting them. But they're tense, cruel, hard, and bitter dreams. They consist of about 80% of my dreams, but they pay off. You'd be surprised. Sometimes when you dream over and over a problem, you get the solution. 
And by gosh, crazy as it may seem in the cold of morning light, it usually works. In fact, to date, they've always worked. And it's a very revealing little insight into the mind of Dick Winters that despite all of these cruelties that constantly surround him, he's always trying to look for a silver lining. His mind is always working. He's a problem solver. And in these moments that we see here, one of his biggest problems is what to do with Norman Dyke. Will he stand up to the pressure of the moment? Winters didn't really have an answer to that question. His options were slim, time was short, manpower was in likewise short supply. Winters was stuck for now, but that would all soon change in the coming days. How could anyone really hope to gain the respect of the toughest, most professional, most dedicated sons of bitches in the entire ETO? Certainly an accurate perspective of how these stalwart paratroopers saw themselves. Even if they would, who'd I put in his place? Shams? Do not ever talk when I'm talking! You got that? Oh, Shames. Ed Shames is the last surviving officer of Easy Company. He and Bradford Freeman are the last two surviving members of Easy Company. Um, I've had the opportunity to converse with him and to interview him on uh, a few occasions. Uh, and uh, he told me that he's never actually seen uh, the series. Um, perhaps uh, he learned that the, the depiction here was uh, not too flattering a depiction of him, and uh, he said that he's never watched it. Uh, so, uh, a really interesting dynamic here as we get into topics of historical memory and the conflicting views of the war and how men acted and what they did and how they interacted with each other in later years. Um, it's worthy of a book in and of itself. Um, I'm not saying he's nuts, I'm just saying... What? What are you saying? Oh, forget it. What? Forget it. Conversations like this feed into kind of the, the long-term foreshadowing uh, that we sense the slow disintegration of these otherwise capable officers such as Buck Compton. And it's leading up to the big moment here that we'll get to shortly. I swam across the Niagara once. Yeah. I swear. On a bet. Richard Spake, the actor who plays Skip Muck here, uh, it, it seems like this that show how the actors were rewarded and how they benefited from communicating with the families of these men. Uh, the story about Niagara Falls and, and him uh, you know, swimming across above the falls uh, was a true life story and it wasn't originally in the script. Uh, but the actor learned of it secondhand uh, through the family in a way and uh, it, it ended up in the series um, and so that was one of the real benefits of those lines of communication being open for these young actors as they were playing these very memorable roles. Is Lieutenant Peacock. I can't think of anybody who deserves this more. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, we <laughs> really glad that you're going home. I've spoken with real-life non-commissioned officers who are really able to relate to this scene uh, because they often have relationships with uh, young lieutenants as such. So uh, a little bit of uh, truth here uh, amidst the script. All right, next, what do they got waiting for us in Foy? At least one company from the 10th Panzer Grenadiers dug in along here. They've also got at least 188, although we haven't been able to spot it yet. Companies D and G of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment had been involved in these uh, hit and run attacks on Foy uh, throughout this week in early 1945 uh, in order to deprive the Germans from gaining a firm, permanent foothold in this uh, next important cross crossroads town uh, further up the line. Uh, so uh, the fight for Foy in many ways was already underway and Easy Company would soon be entering the next phase of it. Don't worry, there's enough crap flying around here, you're bound to get dinged sometime. Almost every single one of these guys has been hit at least once. Statistically speaking, there were very few men in Easy Company that did not earn the Purple Heart at some point during their military service. 
Lieutenant Ronald Spears was one of the platoon leaders in D Company. He was already a legend. The stories about Spears are probably all bullshit anyway. What? And here reemerges the myth of Ronald Spears. Uh, a man who, according to his contemporaries, according to members of his squad who witnessed it, did kill German prisoners as an exigency of the situation that he found himself in in Normandy. There was no accommodations, no room, no facilities to take prisoners, especially when you're on the move being hunted at night. According to Carwood Lipton, though, Ronald Spears did not smoke. Uh, which deflates at least a small portion of the meth. Oh, well, actually, sir, Lieutenant Dykes are not even to bother. They're only going to be here one day. Lieutenant Dykes said that, huh? I don't forget what I said. Among the other really interesting stories in regard to Ronald Spears has to do with one of his interactions that he had with Lieutenant Dyke. At one point, Easy Company and Dog Company were uh, supposed to uh, link up amidst their uh, defensive positions. And uh, Dyke wandered into Dog Company's sector and he got a little bit aggressive with Ronald Spears. Uh, not many people attempted to do that. And uh, Ronald Spears kept really cool, and he says, no, look at your map. You're in my sector. This is where you should be. Uh, Dyke kept persisting, but uh, Spears held his ground, and ultimately, Dyke took easy company elsewhere. And it's one of many moments to demonstrate the fact that Ronald Spears did not put up with anybody's bowl. Oh, anyone care for smoke? You? Spears is often depicted as this cold-hearted killer. Um, indeed, uh, Dick Winters recognized him as such, uh, that he was the most cruel man that I ever knew, uh, to paraphrase some of Dick Winters' words. But at the same time, Spears was a man who was capable of demonstrating compassion and care for his men. He genuinely did care about his troopers. That is often why he was so hard on some of them. Amidst these uh, interactions with the enemy uh, in circling the Fazon Woods in early January 1945, one of his men was struck down during the advance. Spears saw it happen. He ran up to the man. He got a glimpse of who it was and he yelled out, Oh, Joe, not you. And in Carwood Lipton's mind, that demonstrated that Ronald Spears was a man who did have feelings. Uh, he, he did have this, this earnest, sincere empathy uh, for those who were under his command. You know, we can think of uh, Spears as this uh, hard-nosed, ruthless killer, um, but yet at the same time he, of course, was an effective officer who was soon to gain the trust of Easy Company regardless of all the rumor and innuendo surrounding his previous controversies on other battlefields. Once again, the, the lethality of these sorts of barrages, it, it was not just a mere matter of shrapnel flying through the air. It was the trees. Uh, the splinters could kill you. The limbs could fall down and smack you across the skull. Uh, it was an ungodly experience. Medic! In his memoir, Compton tries to offer a little bit of clarification and context to how he remembered this scene. In the series, it shows me coming out of my foxhole to survey the damage. I scream for a medic, then drop my helmet and just stand motionless. In the next scene, there's a fury of activity around me while I'm sitting on a fallen tree with my head in my hands. Then it shows me lying on a cot in a field hospital. I'm in the fetal position in tears with malarkey next to me, trying to read me a letter from back home to cheer me up. 
I appreciate the series for doing that, even though all but one of those scenes were fictionalized, because it shows the progression of a soldier who suffered from combat stress reaction, commonly known as shell shock. Truly, there were men in World War II, in any war, who are so affected by the horror of their experiences that they break under pressure. But although I was affected by the horrors of Bastogne, I do not believe I was clinically shell-shocked, as the series portrays me. In real life, while I was hollering for the medic, trying to figure out what to do, I do remember two distinct other thoughts. And what he was trying to do here, and what he recalls is, how am I going to take care of these wounded guys, and essentially what am I going to do next? After that happens, Compton runs off and he does so looking for Dyke. And when he doesn't find Dyke to call for additional aid from battalion and whatnot, that is when he gets into a rage. And Compton believed that it was his anger at Dyke is what led a lot of men to believe that he was suffering from shell shock and that he had snapped. That is the perspective that is offered in his memoir, Call of Duty. Take it for what it is. It's an interesting perspective. This scene takes place on the night of January 9th, 1945, in the Fazone Woods outside of Raconia as Easy Company was continuing to push closer and closer toward Foy. For those who endured this carnage of unparalleled scale, they remembered it as the night of hell. Uh, and this scene just uh, captures the, the furor of uh, this moment with, with the utmost intensity. And it, it's here in these scenes uh, that the beloved characters of uh, Muck and Pincola uh, meet their sudden end, uh, as was truly the case. A really sad anecdote that, that goes along with this heart-wrenching scene uh, is the fact that four days later, uh, Muck's sister wrote him a letter and she said it it's been a long time since I heard from you how are you doing hope you're doing well etc etc and she wrote that letter not knowing that her brother was already four days gone uh, and so it, it's so important to remember that this this grief and this sense of loss is being felt not only by these men in the foxholes, but also by their loved ones back home. Something that we don't really see in the series too much. In these woods to this very day, there is still unexploded ordnance. And uh, sometimes when battlefield explorers and tourists uh, go, go tramping through these hallowed grounds. They are sometimes told by locals to watch out for these unexploded shells because, of course, all of these years later, they are still quite potent. Captain Winters was wondering if he wanted to go back to battalion and uh, work as his runner for a few days. This was a tactic that Dick Winters used for shell shock soldiers. He said, uh, a few days or even a few hours uh, for these men who were suffering from battle fatigue, a few hours off the line uh, could do a world of good to refresh them, to prepare them for the trials ahead. It was a very effective method that winners did to keep his ranks in line and to keep men uh, mentally healthy for uh, as much as he possibly could under these circumstances. We cleared the woods east and west of Foy. Now it was time for the inevitable assault on Foy itself. Frankly, I was dreading it. One of the predicaments, uh, tactically speaking, in regard to Foy 
is that it was in somewhat of a bowl shape. And uh, it, it made it relatively hard for either side to maintain a firm grip on it. Um, and so uh, there was uh, you know, a constant flurry of, of action that was engulfing it. And a lot of that sets the stage for an all-out assault set for Foy on January 13th, 1945. But on the other hand, I have no confidence in our CO, sir. Lieutenant Dyke is an empty uniform, Captain. He's not there, sir. Well, he's gonna be there tomorrow. Yes, sir. This blunt appraisal on the part of Lipton was somewhat out of form, uh, but as uh, both Winters and Lipton later recalled uh, that a conversation of this nature did happen, that uh, Lipton essentially expressed a vote of no confidence on the part of Dyke. But once again, winners didn't have a lot of flexibility. Uh, there was a drastic shortage of commissioned officers in Easy Company at this moment. But surprisingly, deliverance would come in a quick and unexpected way. The actual assault across these open plains on January 13th, uh, the, the actual pastures itself may have been somewhere between 200 and, and 300 yards. It's a little bit shorter than what we see uh, depicted here, but otherwise it's a, a fairly spot on impression. Keep moving! Easy company! Hold up! Second platoon, hold up! It was about 75 yards out from Foy that Dyke made this fateful decision for uh, these two platoons to halt uh, right on the periphery of Foy. Uh, did he freeze under pressure? That's what some meds said. Uh, for others though, as far as their recollections could be, uh, including Forrest Guth, uh, actually made the argument that Lieutenant Dyke had been slightly wounded and it was his wounding that hampered his decision making at this very stressful moment. Uh, but in either case, whether he cracked or whether he was wounded, Easy Company came to a halt here at, at this given moment. I'm a battalion commander now, get back here! Company, but you... Spurs, get yourself over here! Get out there and relieve Dyke and take that attack on in! Winters became infuriated as he is standing uh, right at the edge of the tree line. And he himself, as we see in these scenes, uh, started running out. He was going to take command of the charge itself, but he stopped himself dead in his tracks. And he essentially said, what are you doing? You're the battalion commander. This is not your place. What we see in the film is Colonel Sink ordering him back. Um, and so uh, there's a slight deviation here from what really happened. But in any case, uh, Winters was uh, growing incredibly impatient. And it's at this uh, dire moment that he looks to his left and he sees Lieutenant Ronald Spears of Dog Company. Winters later said, I don't know why Spears was there, but there he was. And I said, go out, relieve Dyke and take that attack on into town. And indeed, that is what Ronald Spears would do. I'm taking over. Precision Lipton! And here's the iconic Spears run. The lieutenant rushing into the melee to relieve Dyke, take command, and see that this job is done. All right, I want mortars and grenade launchers on that building till it's gone. When it's gone, I want first to go straight in. Forget going around. Everybody else follow me. Yes, sir. Spears was incredibly cool and confident. He ran into the situation exhibiting no fear, although he later admitted that he felt that fear on the inside. He later recalled, I never thought I would make it. Fire! There were German snipers in the, the church that was near the outskirts of town. And as some of the men said, there was also a German 88. 
uh, that was literally like rocking the ground that they were running across. Lieutenant Ronald Spears recalled of that moment, that jarring moment as he runs past a gun, that the vibration, the shock of that gun was something that impressed me. Those are the words that he used. One of the chief concerns of Spears as he is pushing closer and closer to town was the possibility of friendly fire from Item Company on his right flank that was simultaneously moving into the community, although we don't see it here. I think they couldn't quite believe what they were seeing, but that wasn't the really astounding thing. The astounding thing was... As Easy Company began pouring into town, a lot of the German armor that was in the community began to withdraw because they did not want their tanks to become trapped as the Americans were moving in on them. This was something that Spears noticed, and it became necessary for him to act very quickly as a result. He uh, is running practically through the lines as a result of all of this and his mad dash to connect with Item Company. And it was only with, by connecting with Item Company could this assault move forward in a cohesive manner. The astounding thing was that after he hooked up with Eye Company, he came back. Right near the church in Foy, Spears is able to connect with Lieutenant Roger Tinsley of Item Company. Uh, he says, you know, to Tinsley, have your men watch their fire. Don't shoot into my men. We're going to be moving forward. Tinsley gives the hand signal and yells out for his men to stop firing. Spears then departs. He goes back to his two platoons. And right after he leaves Tinsley, Tinsley is shot in the chest by a German machine gun. Spears' dark luck once again persisted here at Foy. It was a small miracle that he was not killed. Had he waited a few seconds longer to go back to his two platoons, in all likelihood he would have been killed right alongside Tinsley. And the rest of the history of Easy Company would have been dramatically different, possibly. Second floor, building on the right. Don't miss Shifty. Even as the majority of the Germans had been flushed out of town, there were still uh, scant traces of resistance, including snipers who were in some of the various dwellings. And if you go and visit Foy to this very day, you can see a lot of the pock marks and scars in the side of the buildings that were inflicted by these rounds all of these decades ago. We'd been looking down at the town of Foy for the better part of a month, knowing that's where we had to go. It was a great relief to have done it. One of the other recollections that Lipton had uh, amidst a lot of the shelling that was in these various woods outside of Foy is how cool, calm, and confident that Colonel Robert Sink was. Uh, Lipton later recalled how as, as these trees were bursting, men were taking cover, seeking shelter, and uh, Sink just continued to lean up against a tree. He didn't duck, he didn't crouch, he didn't flinch. He just continued to stand there. Uh, and that was something that uh, even many years later uh, remained a uh, very uh, memorable moment for Lipton. We spent our night in Rechamp in a convent. It was the first time we'd spent a night indoors in a month. The sisters there brought in their choir to sing for us. It was heaven. This church in Rechamp uh, still stands uh, to this very day. You can go and visit it. And outside of the church, after this series came out, I believe some of the local school children raised money to dedicate a monument to the men of Easy Company who found this brief and peaceful moment of solace inside their congregation. Uh, here in January of 1945. So you can find these very humble memorials placed by Europeans um, all throughout Western Europe, um, but specifically uh, many in regard to uh, Easy Company at their various battlegrounds. Among the dead were Heron, Mellet, Sawasco, Kenneth Webb, Harold Webb, Alex Pankala, and Skip Muck. It's a very powerful moment here as we see these men fade away 
The 506th Regiment as a whole, over the previous month, had lost something like 850 men uh, killed and wounded, oh, and injured. And uh, of those numbers, uh, about 119 were, were killed in action or succumbed to their wounds. Um, and so certainly the other companies within the regiment are also enduring a very horrific toll. I bet if you went back 2,000 years, you'd hear a couple of centurions standing around him yakking about how Tercius lopped off the heads of some Carthaginian prisoners. Like the centurions that he is talking about, um, although uh, he himself was, was drafted, uh, Ronald Spears became a career soldier. He not only led Easy Company throughout the duration of the war, he would become the longest serving commander of Easy Company, but he would also see heavy action in the Korean War. And uh, he would later serve as an American advisor in Southeast Asia during the Loatian Civil War. And so this guy has another 20 years of hard fighting ahead of him before he retires. You don't have any idea who I'm talking about, do you? No, sir. Hell, it was you for a sergeant. Ever since Winters made battalion, you've been the leader of Easy Company. This was the beginning of a very tight friendship between Lipton and Spears. Uh, it, it, it persisted throughout the duration of the war, uh, but yet all of these years later, as Lipton was recalling his former commander, Lipton still said, essentially, I don't know who this man is. Uh, he is an enigma even to me, and I was one of those who was closest to him. Uh, and it just further adds to this mysterious aura of Ronald Spears. Oh. And uh, you're not going to be for a sergeant much longer for a sergeant. Winners put in for a battlefield commission and sink approved on your behalf. It just goes to show that leadership can not only come with bars on your shoulders, but rather stripes on your sleeves. The Breaking Point is such a powerful and effective episode because it shows us the, the earnestness and the realities of warfare how it inflicts uh, psychological damage as well as camaraderie on those men who are fighting it. And uh, through uh, the, the cinematic vehicle of Carwood Lipton, we also get a strong sense of the brand of leadership that can emerge in those times of desperation. This is really one of uh, the, the key elements that makes the breaking point so powerful and so effective in our understandings of fighting units in the Second World War. In our next episode, we will be following Easy Company as they push ever and ever closer toward Nazi Germany. We look forward to seeing you then.